Mr. Collins. Yeah. Thank you for giving me your time. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the great talk, though. Yeah. Also, um, Glad you enjoyed it. Could you talk to me a little about your career? Uh, yeah. So uh, I went to school at the Ringling. At the time, it was called the Ringling School of Art and Design, but now it's the Ringling College of Art and Design. Uh, and I graduated, and I got my bachelor's degree in computer animation. Uh, so I graduated from school, and then I didn't have a job, and I wasn't a very good animator. So I'm originally from New Jersey. I went back home to New Jersey, and I had kind of a moment of reflection where I was like, what am I going to do with my life? I need to be a better animator. So I had a relative that lived in California, and so I drove across country to move in with them. And so basically I spent my days kind of driving up to LA from Orange County, tossing out reels, trying to get my first job. Uh, and then when I wasn't doing that, I was back at home working on animation. So then after tossing out all my kind of resumes and reels, I got my first job at this place called Blind in LA. It was a motion graphics house, a boutique house. Okay. Um, and then from there, more motion graphics, and I eventually got a break working on this movie called Barnyard in San Clemente, California. I did Barnyard for almost two years. I started as a cleanup animator and then I made my way to animator. And then from there, it was just kind of a string of different movies, mainly at Sony Pictures Imageworks. So I worked on uh, Beowulf, I Am Legend, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, Alice, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and then I left and I went to Disney to work on Tangled for about 10 months. And then after Tangled, I came back to Sony Pictures Imageworks to work on Arthur Christmas, which is the Aardman movie. And then after that, I went to Blizzard and started working. Oh, I'm sorry. I also worked at Naughty Dog. Yeah. Uh, doing in-game cinematics. No. On which cinematic project? animation. On which project? <laughs> Uncharted 2. Uncharted 2. Uh, Among Thieves. Uh, so you've had the chance to work in film no. using no. keyframe no. animation, no. motion capture, and then games. Mm -hmm. Gameplay animation, mm -hmm. cinematics. Yeah, I've done a little bit of everything. Yeah. I haven't done stop motion. No, not yet. Yeah. Is it something you're aiming for? Oh, not aiming for, but I would love the opportunity to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Leica's work. I love Box Trolls and Paranorman, and I just love, I love the like handmade quality of stop motion animation. Yeah. I have no clue if I'd be any good at it because it's very, I don't, I'm assuming it's very difficult to manipulate a character. But, uh, you know, and there's all sorts of special rigs that they use to make it, like, so that the, when they're off the ground, it doesn't look like yeah, you yeah. see the wires and all that. So uh, I'd love to just play around with one of those little armatures, though. And does your animation approach varies depending on the type of tools, I'd say, or the type of project you're working on? It varies. Well, in film, it would vary on the shot, you know? You would change your kind of approach to things depending on kind of like what you had to animate. It was like a big crowd shot. Obviously, you don't want to do things that you would use in say like a medium shot or a close-up shot. There's different there's a different kind of like bag of tricks that you use for different shots. For games, same thing, you know. If I'm doing a like a ready cycle or like a combat cycle where they're just kind of sitting there breathing with a weapon, my tool set for that is very different than my tool set for doing an attack, which is a very broad action, you know. So I want to do like pose to pose. For an attack, um, just different things for different situations. Yeah, for sure. Not necessarily tools, though. Just kind of, you know, depending on the situation, I approach something a different way. Uh, what's your take on motion capture? It's a valuable tool for video games, for sure. I mean, I worked with it at Naughty Dog, and I worked with it on Beowulf, and to a degree on I Am Legend. It's helpful. And especially when you can go in and like take a motion capture shoot, like the data from it, pull out the keys, and then animate your own thing from it. Like that's invaluable, you know? Because yeah. there's something about kind of keyframe animation that allows you the pliability to kind of, you know, mess with motion capture data at the same time. And I kind of like it like that, you know? I don't, I'm not a huge fan of just raw motion capture data in any game because I feel like an animator at some point has to touch that data to make it appealing, you know, because it's not going to be appealing right off the bat. And also, there's a lot of stuff that you don't capture in a motion capture setting anyway, like fingers and facial expressions and stuff like that. Blizzard is a pretty well-known company. Yeah. Do they have a, a secret sauce, a secret signature in the, in the visuals or the way they treat the animation? Not the way they treat the animation. I mean, I don't think there's a secret sauce. The secret sauce is the people that work at Blizzard, you know? I mean, they 
value their employees so highly, I think that is a reflection of the work that they output at the company, you know? Uh, there's no, like, book that we all read that makes us better animators or, or, or cinematics more appealing than somebody else's. It's just kind of, you know, in the water at Blizzard. They, it's a culture of excellence, and I think people try to achieve excellence every day at work. Yeah. Since you've had a chance to work in different studios, do you think there's uh, something lacking currently in the industry that needs fixing, maybe in the process of the pipeline, or the way we are your people, or the way... Uh, well, there's always that kind of, I mean, one of the things that appealed to me about games was that it was, like I say, very much a marathon and not a race. I really like that production format. Um, the feature film production format is very kind of nomadic, almost in a sense. Unless you're full-time at a company, it's nine months or ten months on a movie, and then go find another movie to work on. Maybe you get a little break in between. And it's just a style that... I wasn't necessarily a fan of, but that's because it's also the nature of the beast, you know? I mean, companies can't always line up movies back to back all the time, so it doesn't make sense for them to keep on employees between those times when there's no movies. So I understand it. I mean, if anything, you know, just production scheduling movies a little bit tighter so that we could stay together as a team at an animation studio as opposed to kind of breaking up and then coming back again. Of all your career, what's your proudest moment? What's the thing you're really proud to say that you did? I, I don't know. I don't think it's any particular shot. I think it's... I'm proud of you know all my shots, I guess, in a way. But uh, I'm really proud of the work I did on Cloudy. I think it's funny stuff, which that's kind of always what I'm shooting for. I'm kind of a weird guy. Like I like funny animation. Uh, it was just a style that I really, like, I felt like my personal style and cloudy style kind of, you know, meshed really well together. So, uh, you know, that was the most fun I've had animating on an animated film. So, yeah, I guess I could call that my proudest moment. <laughs> <laughs> and um, do you approach cartoony animation differently than realistic animation? Yeah, for yeah. sure, yeah. It's not it's not the same kind of tool set. I mean, it's grounded in the same things, you know? Like, even cartoony animation has a sense of timing and a sense of weight to it, but there's a lot of rules that you break in cartoony animation that I'm not necessarily trying to break in realistic animation. I spend a lot of time in realistic animation trying to add dirt to it so it looks unintentional. Like, that's my whole thing. It's like, uh... So much of the stuff we do, like in real life, and you, you'll see it in motion capture data when you capture somebody walking around a stage, is this kind of like fidgety, unintentional looking things. And it's hard to animate something unintentional because by nature, you're intentionally trying to make something. So to intentionally make the unintentional, it's, it's really strange. So always trying to add that, on the realistic stuff, always trying to add that layer of kind of like dirt and nuance that you don't necessarily wouldn't think to animate if you were doing a cartoony piece, which is very broad, you know. There's very little nuance in the cartoony stuff. And uh, what's your pre-production process? I mean, you get a shot or you get an assignment, a system to do. What What are you, the steps you, you go through to attain the, the final result? Well, I try to prep, you know. I try to... You know, if there's the opportunity, I try to find some sort of reference or some sort of cultural landmark that I can say, oh, okay, well, this creature is going to move like this, or I could use this as reference for, like, timing, or something like that. So I try to gather reference at the beginning, if I can. Uh, I don't always have the opportunity to. At that point, it's kind of, I like to iterate on my poses. So once I start posing inside of Maya, I'll try to do as many different poses and as many different choices as I can because oftentimes my first gut reaction is not the most appealing pose to me. So I'll iterate on a bunch of poses and then if it's a regular, um, like a combat cycle, like a layered animation type thing, I'll make sure, well, I'll always spend a lot of time on that first pose, but that first pose on a combat animation cycle really has to kind of sing. So I'll spend a lot of time on that. And then if it's something like a broad action, I'll start posing out in stepped. And, but even when I'm posing out in step keys, I'm always kind of like thinking about 
like what is the arc of this particular object, this particular body mass of the character? How how does how am I describing his arc through the scene? And even in step keys, you can see it if you tap fast enough to kind of like as you're popping in between your poses, you can see that kind of arc, the way things are traveling. And if you have a pose that's like outside of that arc, just reining it back in so that you can kind of like visualize your timing in the scene. And then after that, a lot of it is just for me, like for uh, an attack, it's straight aheading. So I'll, I'll, I'll get my poses, I'll break it down to maybe like four or fives, you know, like a, po- a, key, uh, a key pose on every four or five frames. And then I'll start with the root and just start, I'll toss it all on spline and I'll just start massaging only that one controller until I have a motion that I'm happy with and then that motion then informs all my other joints so it's like I'm kind of applying that layered approach to stepped animation to you know to um, like uh, attacks and stuff like that so if I know the root is doing one thing I know the spine is going to have to overlap a certain way also and so hopefully that's already in the posing that I've already done in step mode, but if it's not, I'm going in and I'm massaging curves to get exactly what I want to see inside the game. And I'm always checking from all angles. That's the best. I mean, that's the most important thing I'd have to say is like always check top, bottom, left, right, you know, under his armpit. Like every single, po- or every single you know, 360 degrees of rotation around the character, essentially. Uh, and then cleaning up as I go, making sure that if I have cur- uh, keys on a curve that don't describe the curve, just get rid of them because they're useless data to me. Because when I scale, and I oftentimes scale animations, I want to make sure that I don't have any sort of cruft on the, you know, in the keys because I can start getting tangents that start shooting my curves past where I want them to go, giving me unintentional overshoots, and then it just takes forever to clean up after that. So clean it up, and then yeah, that's basically. So you said you're looking at the arcs. What are the most important things you're looking at in animation? Like with the things I'm focusing on? Yeah, most? a lot. Uh, appeal. I say that word a lot, but it's true. Like an appealing pose takes in so many different design factors into play. Like that's something I'm always trying to push because right out of the box characters, there's a level of appeal, you know, when the character model lure character modeler made it but you have to add so much more in animation so I mean like you know Blackhand from today's talk his face is appealing it's cool it's based off the HD orc in World of Warcraft but when he gets into that pose giving him that kind of demeanor that tells me like I know who this character is it's really important to me and so when I'm blocking things out I always include the face or at least a pose on the face because it helps me inform my other pose choices if I have this like scowl on that guy while I'm posing other things it just ma- it, it makes me pose differently because I know I know who this guy is because he's already got this kind of horrible grimace on his face I'm not going to animate him you know, in a kind of gentler way than I would if he was like, you know, had a happy face on or whatever. It helps you create uh, more character in the posing. Exactly, yeah. Uh, Having the face there just to like reference as I'm posing just helps me yeah, get a grip on like what the character is like. Yeah, for sure. Uh, other than that, yeah, arcs. Keeping cur- curves simple, offsetting things creatively so that you get these kind of free arcs out of Maya. I, I really like seeing that. I mean, the, it's all over WoW. Um, yeah, I don't know. How do you approach creating different characters who have different persona? I mean, as animators, we are looking so much into the detail, looking at the arcs, having anticipation, squash and stretch. There comes a point that the priority is distinguishing the different characters in the scene, especially in movies. How did you manage to make it different, but everybody shine in a certain way? Well, you just have to look at, I mean, you can't always like determine from a design standpoint what characters are going to be paired with other characters because in sometimes in the games they'll throw certain characters in with other ones that you didn't necessarily think they were part of the same kind of kit. But I mean texturally you can animate things so much different from each other. I mean even big say you had a lineup of three big burly guys, there's so many different ways that you can change that root's motion, the character's root, so that 
it kind of displays a different kind of burly guy in each one just by offsetting the curves differently that it really is kind of it's kind of I don't want to say it's easy it's kind of it's um it's not difficult to kind of differentiate characters just by making small timing changes in your animation if you understand what I mean so that's how I'd probably do it. I mean, certain characters' designs lend themselves to certain kinds of motion, right? Like, uh, like so the Arakoa, like we were talking about earlier today in the talk, you know, the old Burning Crusade one is real kind of sniveling, and that character design lends itself to a certain kind of type of motion. That's the same thing with, like, just about everything we animate. It's like, it's so clear. You see the character and you're like, it's very rare that I see a character and I'm like, mm, I don't know what the personality of this guy is. It's like, wow is over the top and that's awesome because it lets us know like, okay, how am I going to make this guy move? Well, let me take a look at him. Oh, well, that makes sense. So yeah, that's basically what I do. What was your favorite character overall to animate in, in wow? your career? Oh, Whatever. favorite character? Yeah. I really liked animating Rapunzel. She Rapunzel. was... Her rig was awesome. The engineers at Disney, the riggers, they do an amazing job on the rigs. Uh, it was really cool. Yeah, she was. She wore kind of like a purple jumpsuit throughout the whole. I mean, I didn't. We didn't see her with the dress on because the dress was simmed most of the time. But uh, animating her was really nice. So she was e really easy to put in an appealing pose. And um, the movie was really appealing. Yeah. The did you have rules or a set of tricks to make characters more appealing? There were little tricks here and there. Things like opening an eye. An eye on this side of the face is going to be larger than an eye on this side of the face if you're looking in this direction. You know, uh, rotating the teeth so that they match the upper lip line. Just things that just kind of push the appeal of a character a little bit further. These are things that we tried to kind of put in a tangle. How did you manage to animate a feminine character with appeal and a sense of cheapness? Yeah. When it, it it's not you. I mean. Yeah, not feminine. You, you're not feminine <laughs> at all. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Well, that's just from observation. You know, observe. I mean, I grew up in a house of four women. You know, I have four younger sisters, uh, and obviously, of course, my mom. Like, uh, I had a I. I interacted with women a lot growing up. Uh, I think, you know, that interaction helped for sure. And then just, you know, cultural touchstones, like movies, things like that, they all helped us. I mean, oftentimes, like, the animation directors would kind of reference a certain scene of a movie that would be good to watch for a certain scene inside of Tangle. So uh, we'd watch that. And, you know, it's just, it, you know, it's just talking and knowing women helps you make... Uh, better choices in your animation for sure I mean but that said the female animators on that team had a leg up on us because they were women themselves yeah. so they knew exactly how a woman tucks her hair behind her ear or does all sorts of like fidgets and stuff like that and, and that stuff is perfect for animation because that's really what kind of helps a character kind of come to life is those little bits in between the lines you know the little adjustments that women make or uh, the little things that we can add, little bits of truth that we can add into our animation that kind of make it that much better. And what was your greatest obstacle in your career that oh, you've overcome? Boy. Greatest obstacle? I don't know, man. I mean, every day there's a new challenge for sure. I mean, working... Uh, I feel like every day somebody's going to, like, catch me. They're going to be like... You fooled us for this long. You're not an animator, you know, like, you, you've done a good job, uh, but we've caught on to your game, you know? And I, I feel like, I guess it keeps me on my toes that way because, you know, if I'm constantly feel like the jig is almost up, uh, I'm constantly trying to improve myself. So the, the, I guess my biggest struggle is constantly trying to improve, you know? Like, that's not becoming complacent with my abilities today always looking forward to tomorrow to try to improve what I've done and what, and what I can do. And do you, uh, do you do specific things? Do you look at the f uh, specific blogs or read certain books to keep you on, on toes? Or? Yeah, um, what do I do? I try to see as many animated movies as I possibly can, that's for sure. 
Um, like I just saw the box trolls. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Like really. that again. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I read a lot of blogs. I have like a RSS feed reader that I just have like a mega list of blogs. But I look at like I try to look at all si kinds of animation, you know, not just CG animation. Uh, and just I just look for things that inspire me. And a lot of times, I'll get pumped up to animate just because I've seen like a really cool drawing from an artist. I follow their blog or. I may have seen another piece of animation or I've seen a clip from a game that really kind of inspires me. And then like, I'll try to use all that stuff as like fuel from the day, right? Like in the morning I get into work, I look at a couple of blogs and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna put that into my animation today, so. That's nice, after what, 10 years in the industry? Yeah, I don't, well, I don't wanna become complacent, man. You're still a student. Yeah, oh, you're, all, you're a student till the day you die, absolutely. That's yeah. nice. You don't stop learning. And the second you do, uh, it's done. You're done because it's like you know, there's something you can learn from everybody. Even people who know less than you about animation, there's always something you can learn from them that you didn't potentially know yourself. You know, like that whole thing of ego. That's not good, man. Ego gets in the way of progress. Ego gets in the way of like you learning more about yourself and more about how to be a good animator. And, and what's next for you? more wow man you know I, I love blizzard and i can't wait to uh, you know we're obviously still working wow's not going anywhere so we're you know uh i go to work every day working on wow and it's great because uh, every day there's a new creature with 40 legs or a new 20 tentacled you know beast that's sitting on my desk and it needs to get animated and it's just it's awesome the variety is amazing you know because you come into work and it's like something different every day do you feel a certain pressure since it's a very popular game and it, there's a fan base that is really established? Yeah, sure. I feel pressure to, you know, deliver what the fans expect for sure. I mean, we have such a like a you know a, a, a passionate player base. None of us want to let them down, you know. So, you know, it's not like a, I don't lose sleep over the pressure, but I mean, it's something that we're definitely aware of and that we're trying to kind of you know we're trying to put out the best game we possibly can and hopefully we did thank you man yeah you're really welcome appreciate, Seth. Your Thanks, time. Man. appreciate it